Okay, guess what? It's the last week of class and here we go. American music. Okay, we're going on to American music. And uh, I'm going to talk about one of the greats, certainly, in American art music. And his name is Aaron Copland. Aaron Copland. 1900 to 1990. Aaron Copland, 1900 to 1990. And we're going to talk about his um, influences, and we're also going to talk about um, uh, why his music is American. Why his music is American. Um, Aaron Copland uh, was born in Brooklyn to Russian Jewish immigrants. And he says, no one ever talked music to me or took me to a concert. Music as an art was a discovery I made all by myself. And so he was largely self-taught at the beginning. And at age 15, he decided to become a composer. And he studied with a conservative teacher who said, oh, Aaron, stay away from that modern music, right? Modern music, you know, it was getting back, certainly uh, European music, getting back uh, over here to America and Copeland, you know, listening to uh, what Stravinsky is doing and others. Um, in 1921, Copeland went to France. Uh, he was uh, the first American to study composition with a very famous composition teacher, a woman by the name of Nadia Boulanger. And other Americans will follow. Other very successful American composers will go over to study in France now. It's France. It's 1921. What are we looking at? We're looking at Stravinsky. We're looking at Debussy. We're looking at... Um, so the ballet, ballet Russe, we're looking at so many different things. And there goes Copeland, the American, nice Jewish boy from Brooklyn, going over to Paris, and he sees and, and breathes all of these influences. Um, Boulanger's teaching, uh, um, and certainly the stimulating atmosphere of Paris uh, with Picasso and Stravinsky, Hemingway, among others, felt at home. And uh, certainly, these influences would have a lasting effect on Copeland's music. So he returned after three years in Paris. And um, Copeland says that he was, I quote, anxious to write a work that would immediately be recognized as American in character. And it's 1925. He comes out with a piece called Music for the Theater. Now, that's not a shock. What do we have? What do we have going on in this country? We have theater, Broadway, right? We have jazz as well. We have a folk tradition. And you know what? Copeland is going to assimilate all of those influences as well. And so his music for the theater was very jazzy. For small orchestra, we have elements of blues, elements of ragtime, and... Um, <coughs> His jazz period did not last very long, and uh, in the early 30s, he got into the real, real serious, serious stuff. As a matter of fact, um, he wrote a very stark uh, piano variations with, with very, very um, in, in power and percussiveness. For Copeland, it was, it was very, very different than music of the theater, and that was only five years later. So he really, he's a composer who's going to dabble in everything. He wrote film music, as we will see, as well. Um, he, after the 1930s, he started writing for a much larger um, public. And, of course, we had economic problems as well during this time. He said, I began to feel an increasing dissatisfaction with the relations of the music-loving public and the living uh, composer. Um, he felt that most uh, concert goers could not gr grasp this highly dissonant music. And you're all probably agreeing with him after listening to Piero Lunaire, correct? You're all going, yeah, what are you going to do about it, Aaron Copeland? Well, what he does about it um, is something very, very interesting. It made no sense to ignore them and continue writing as if the audience did not exist. I felt that it was worth the effort to see if I couldn't say what I had to say in the simplest possible terms. Bam! He goes right to the ballet, and he creates Billy the Kid in 1938, the ballet Rodeo, in 1942, and a Pulitzer Prize winning ballet, Appalachian Spring, in 1944. And these works 
very accessible to all of us, very American. And we'll talk about that in a minute. His film scores of Mice and Men, Our Town, um, brought his music to the mass public. A great work as well, The Lincoln Portrait in 1942. It is a piece of music that uh, goes right along with somebody narrating the Gettysburg Address. So there he was, and he received a lot of uh, popularity and, of course, the Pulitzer Prize uh, in, uh, in 1944. And for 25 years, he taught young composers every, um, every summer at Tanglewood, which is up in uh, Massachusetts. And uh, he also was a conductor and conducted throughout the world and composed uh, for, you know, almost up to his last days. And he lived quite a long time. Did Copeland dabble in the 12-tone world? Yup. He did everything. All of these little influences, you'll see him try. And then he comes into his own, and we have this wonderful American music. The piece we're going to talk about, Appalachian Spring. Appalachian Spring wins the Pulitzer Prize in 1944, originally scored as a ballet for Martha Graham, the great modern dancer, and I hope you know of her. Um, it took him a year, year to finish it, and... Um, he said this about Appalachian Spring, how foolhardy it is to be spending all this time writing a 35-minute score for a modern dance company, knowing how short-lived most ballets and their scores are. Aha, but he was fooled, certainly. Um, and what he did was, not only is this a ballet, but it was also uh, reorchestrated from 13 instruments, which is its original version. And I tell you, as a violist, that is quite frightening, because it is very difficult. But then what he did is reorchestrated it for orchestra. So, yes, it is a ballet. The original version is in 13 instruments. The one we are going to listen to is for full orchestra. Now, what is this ballet about? Appalachian Spring. You ready? This is real complex, okay? A pioneer celebration in spring around a newly built farmhouse in the Pennsylvania hills. Okay. It is American, okay? It's in the early 1800s, and its characters include a bride, a groom, a neighbor, a revivalist preacher with his followers. What is it about this? Of course, it has an American theme. But the rhythms and melodies are American sounding. Barn dances, fiddle tunes, um, a shaker melody. Does anybody know the shakers? They're a group, uh, I mean, I'm going to be embarrassed to say this, kind of like the Amish, closed community. Uh, my mother in Connecticut always used to go up to the shaker community to buy furniture because it's like the most incredible, beautiful furniture. Um, but they also have their own tunes. And this, tis a gift to be simple, tis a gift to be free. We have all heard this. Da dum, da 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 dum, da da dum, right? That beautiful melody. It's a shaker tune. Copeland's going to steal it and put it in the end of Appalachian Spring. How perfect. How absolutely perfect. But I tell you, with all of what we're about to hear, the fiddle dances and the barn tunes, it is difficult because Copeland adds his originality, his influences from Paris. And so rhythmically, we have a lot going on, as well as these really great fiddle tunes. It is very deceptive music. It is also music where you feel really naked to the world, kind of like I do talking on TV. But you really do. Quite often, he has the entire orchestra playing very, very difficult rhythms all together. And if you're not together with everybody else, you're in trouble. You need a very good conductor to lead you through this. And so we're going to listen to this beautiful ballet suite. Um, and we are going to listen to the very end of it, which is called Simple Gifts. Okay? And so this is the very end of Appalachian Spring. And it is a theme in variations. What a great idea. It's a beautiful tune. Why not hear it again and again? Okay? Simple Gifts from Appalachian Spring, the ballet by Aaron Copeland. Okay, that was Aaron Copeland, and that was Simple Gifts from Appalachian Spring. And uh, his music, yes, has American themes, but please remember, he was trained in France. So we have a lot of individuality. We have the European training, and we have uh, the uh, Copeland the American. Uh, and his works are incredibly enjoyable. I highly recommend um, really anything 
Uh, we have the wonderful uh, Lincoln Portrait, which is wonderful, and um, uh, many others, Fanfare for the Common Man, which is on, oh, lots of TV shows I have seen, a very regal piece of music. Uh, so here is our first American composers. There were composers before him, and we will look uh, at some composers after him as well. But that was Aaron Copland, 1900, died um, in 1990. We have passed uh, World War I. We are also going to pass World War II. And so uh, the next chapter in your book is musical styles since 1945 or uh, the end of World War II. And of course, what is going to come into play? Computers, television, space satellites, unlimited flow of information. It is almost now, in 2001, um, mesmerizing. My question, are we becoming less human? And what, what has become of art uh, since this, this age of technology is uh, coming about very, very quickly? Many composers today change their musical points of view with astonishing rapidity, composing this way and that, moving easily from complete traditionalism to the avant, avant guard. And so we'll be looking at composers, and we just did. Certainly Mr. Copeland was dabbling in a lot of different things. And we are going to look at other composers who are going to take chances and then go back to a, maybe a more conservative uh, point of view within their music. So some of the characteristics of music um, since 1945 we will have the increased use of the 12-tone system. The 12-tone system set up by Arnold Schoenberg, other composers will follow using that technique. We'll also uh, extend the use of the 12-tone system and we will go into what is called serialism. Um, and that is the use of techniques of the 12-tone system to organize rhythm, uh, dynamics, and tone color. We will also see chance music. Chance music. Anybody see the movie Pollock? watching Jackson Pollock um, making his art, you know, just with these drips on the canvas. It's all by chance. Uh, chance music is uh, kind of the same thing in which the composer chooses pitches, tone colors, and rhythms uh, by random methods. I will never forget one of my first concerts in from a master's degree. A composer said, please play this music, please play this music. Okay, fine. All you had to do was, there were five people on stage, and you had a list of um, a number of little motives. Could be three notes, could be four notes, and we all had a set of dice. You roll the dice, <coughs> clink, in the, while the concert was going on, and then you'd play your little motive. Then the next person would go, and they'd play their little motive. And then you crossed off the motive, and the last one standing uh, I don't know, won the game. I don't know. I don't know. But um, uh, basically, you had to play all of your motives, and that was the whole point. That's called chance, right? We talked about also uh, John Cage's four minutes and 33 seconds, where the pianist sits at the piano for four minutes and 33 seconds, right? Chance music. What are we, what's the deal there? Well, it is all random about what is around us in any given time, right? Chance music. You guys are just going to love this. You're going to love it. Okay. Minimalism, right? Here's an offshoot that we've known certainly from art and of music. Characterized by a steady pulse, a lot of repetition, clear tonality, very short melodic patterns. Very short melodic patterns. And this can get hmm, sometimes rather annoying uh, and sometimes uh, rather interesting the way these uh, melodies are combined. Um, we will also see a return to tonality. Some composers are going to get sick of what's going on and they're going to say, give me back C major. And of course, they do it because it's their right. We also have the entrance of electronic music, right? Electronic music. I'll never forget the first time I played a piece for viola and tape. So you go out and you bow, you look at the tape recorder and you press play. And so you play off of what is on that tape. It's very difficult. It's very nerve-wracking to try to do. And I don't trust myself when it comes to a piece of electronics. If it was another person, I'd be fine, because if I made a mistake, they could adapt to me. The computer can't, right? The tape can't do that. So that's very, very difficult. We are going to uh, call this uh, time as well the liberation of sound, because anything goes. Anything. I have had to scream. I have had to do so many different things I can't tell you. Knock on the back of my instrument, uh, 
take my bow and throw it against my instrument very gently. Um, uh, you know, very difficult things you have to do with your instrument, and your instrument's expensive, so, you know. But uh, anything goes. So we'll see some very interesting sounds. We're also going to add mixed media, right? A lot of mixed media, and there, certainly we're going to see this in the art worlds as well. New concepts of rhythm and form, and as we t we're going to get a taste of, of uh, different, a couple of different composers, and we're going to look at what their contributions are, because this is, again, this is wide and varied. And so the next time I see you, we will, do, uh, we will talk about three composers uh, past uh, 1945. We have heard this idea of new music, right, throughout history. New music. What is new music? Um, every generation of creative musicians have produced sounds and styles that have never before been heard, right? But the years since World War II have been so far-reaching, so far-reaching in uh, innovations that probably more than any previous association with the word new music, we can really identify uh, with applying the label to music of the present. Um, we have witnessed nothing less in this t the 20th century than the birth of a new world of sound. We've been talking about sound, and sound has really changed now, and we are going into really new, interesting, areas. Um, and we've been talking about and we've been looking at art. We've been looking at the art of the cubis. Well, beyond the cubis, we're going to see Dadaism and uh, the work of the surrealists and the futurists in music who are, demi who are uh, uh, experimenting with noise. They called it the art of noise. And of course, that is going to influence the art of noise is going to influence what? Well, electronic music that's going to come down the pike. So it's a very interesting progression, very interesting progression in um, the 20th century. Art since the Second World War um, has unfolded, certainly, against turmoil, right? We've been talking about this, this artistic cataclysm that has done away with 500 years of artistic principle, right? We looked at that first decade of the 20th century. Now as we go in towards the middle, right, we have, we're past World War I, we're past World War II, and it is turmoil. And the work of the expressionists and the abstract expressionists are giving us, in their art, the bloodbath, right? And it is no different. Um, uh, the 50s and 60s are the same thing. We have social turmoil. And of course, social turmoil, turmoil is always within art and music. We can go back to uh, the Greeks and say the same thing. So it's no different. Um, there can be no question that as the second half of the century wore on, the problems confronting civilization came, became more severe, right? Became more severe. The knowledge that man has finally achieved the capacity to wipe himself off the face of the earth right, broods over time and, and makes, us, makes us very uneasy. And so we're going to look at that tension as well within music. How does the Cold War end up in music? Well, Vietnam is going to end up in music. So many things end up in music. This restlessness of spirit, this restlessness, um, is of course reflected in the arts. And we're going to have violent experimentation with new kinds of materials, anything in the orchestra, anything. Anything can be an instrument. Anything, right? Um, artists might want to feel, feel, feel. Musicians and artists might not want to feel and reject feeling altogether. So we've talked about this idea of expression, and now we're going to, some composers are going to go with that expression and go with the social turmoil, and some poets and, and composers are going to go away from feeling, totally. And so it's really a wide open space. And uh, uh, we're going to look at uh, some representative, representative composers. And uh, again, this is very wide open, so it's been very difficult for me to kind of whittle this down, so I'm going to, of course, use what is, what is in your book. And I'm going to talk about three 
American composers, ones that I think have, have made some uh, great impact on the music of the 20th century and have used uh, these um, upheavals as part of their music. And they are John Cage, who was born in 1912, died in 1992. Uh, also, uh, George Crumb, uh, who is still alive. And um, last but not least, John Adams, a uh, really wonderful composer uh, who composed the opera Nixon in China. Uh, it's probably one of his most famous works. Uh, we're going to look at a piece called Short Ride on a Fast Machine, meaning you're in a sports car and you're going 100 miles an hour, and this is his uh, impression of what this feels like that, that happens.